As you look around our group today, make sure you say hello to our family members. And um, I'm not going to say the sinner sitting on the back row, but the folks sitting on the back row, make sure you welcome them and say hello. That's okay, we got a lot of back row people. I said one time in worship uh, practice a long time ago, I was that we were all asked what would make it more comfortable for us, and I said a recliner. And everybody starts saying yes, and bless this man's heart, he said, "Well, I'll ask them." Well, you see how much that went. No recliners. I want to start in Psalm 100. Shout for the Lord. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. If you want to know what makes Daddy happy, let's stand and sing this song as we enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. into his presence with thanksgiving we come into his presence with songs of praise we come into his presence this morning in peace we come into his presence this morning in safety that is not true for many in this world as we come into this place to sing song and to give adoration to a God who is worthy, let us also be mindful of our brothers and sisters around the world who this day cannot meet, that must hide, that are not living in peace and safety as we are. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we do give you praise and adoration and we sing to you because you have made us glad. And this is separate from our situation. But Lord, we are mindful this day that many around the world are not in a place like we are. They are not in a place of safety. They're not in a place of peace. They're in a place of tumult and oppression, war and threat. Lord, as we come to this May Day, I'm reminded of the 
celebrations that I saw in my youth in the USSR on the 1st of May. And we have seen in these past months a return to that style of aggression in the Russian nation. And so, Lord, I am exceptionally mindful and wish to pray this morning for Russia. I pray, Lord God, for their leadership. I pray this morning that you would, with your almighty hand, reach down and grab President Vladimir Putin by the ear and get his attention. I pray, Lord God, that you would surround him with men and women with godly intent. That they would have ears to hear and hearts to obey. Lord, I pray this morning for Patriarch Kirill, leader of the Russian Orthodox Church, who has made the hopeless mistake of confusing his faith with his politics. Lord, may no man of God ever stand for a war of aggression. Lord, forgive him, I pray, for dressing his politics up and hiding them behind a holy war. I pray, Lord God, instead that you would soften his heart, that he might be able to unite the churches of Russia in prayer, in strength, in recognizing that they are citizens of your kingdom first and citizens of the world second. I pray, Lord God, that you would give him a voice that he might serve the Prince of Peace and not political pundits. I pray for the church in Russia that they would have a heart for their neighbors, that they would recognize faith like faith. It was only three years ago the church in Ukraine and the church in Russia separated leadership. These are churches, Lord God, that for generations have worshipped together. And I pray that this day, the hearts of Christians around the world would unite in proclaiming the peace of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Lord, this morning I pray for the people of Russia that they may know the truth. Lord, they live in a government that tells them what they want them to know. But we know full well that there is no place that moves news faster than the rumor mill. And I don't care what culture that's a part of. And I pray, Lord God, that the Russian people would know the truth. That they would rise and hold their leaders accountable. That they would stand for the workers that they celebrate on this day of labor. For this May 1st in Europe is largely like the American Labor Day where we celebrate the workers. Lord, I pray that this May Day in Russia, in Ukraine, and across Europe, they might recognize that they are to be workers in a field ripe unto harvest. Workers for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords that we would set aside our swords so that you might turn them into plowshares. Lord God, I know that these nations and these people are your children. And I simply pray this morning that they each might return to be able to worship as we do this morning in peace and in safety. I ask, Lord God, that you would fill our hearts with a over-generous praise, that we would recognize the bounty and the blessing that we enjoy this morning, and that we would praise you with that level of passion, that level of appreciation, that level of thanksgiving. 
Speak, Lord God, to Your people that we might praise You all the more. For You are faithful, You are gracious, You are God, and there is no other. Lord, we know that in time every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that You are Lord. As we come here this morning, we choose this day to call You Lord and not wait for another day. Receive our praise through Christ our Lord. Amen. In Isaiah 51, I'm going to pull out some of the verses, but feel free whenever you want to to read the whole thing. It's pretty good. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness and seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were cut. Listen to me, my people. Hear me, my nation. The law will go out from me. My justice will become light to the nations. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. Look at the earth beneath. The heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, but my salvation will last forever. Hear me, you who know what is right. You people who have my law in your hearts, do not fear the reproach of men. For the moth will eat them up like a garment, and the worm will devour them like wool, but my righteousness will last forever, my salvation through all generations. The ransomed, here's the therefore, the ransomed of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee. If someone asks you a question, for, uh, a question of your joy, and from whence does it come? It comes from the Lord above. Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing. Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing. world there are remnants the remnants of the Lord's people keep them in prayer too this week that God will raise them up into a mighty army to show the light show the way and remember we're remnants too and it's a big group it's not just a little rip of cloth it's a big tapestry that covers this whole world created by the Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit for his glory be a remnant. Jesus. 
strength my shield to you alone may my spirit yield you alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship thee I want you more than gold or silver only you can satisfy you alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye for you alone are my strength my shield As we sing this next song, Above All, we discussed this morning in rehearsal the words, the two words that are so important in this, above all. I want you to watch how that term, above all, is used in this song, particularly how the song ends.
most of you know that communion is based beginning with the Passover in Exodus 12. Now, if you ever stood up here, you uh, realize that it's pretty intimidating. Uh, you know that no matter how wise or how eloquent, nothing, nothing you say is going to touch the awesomeness of God. So God's given us pictures, a whole book full of pictures, especially the book of Exodus. So we're taking the 12th chapter of Exodus, the original Passover, which the Israelites celebrated off and on for a thousand years, mostly off. And after God got their attention with the Babylonian captivity, they realized, hey, God means what he says. And so established the Seder meal as an annual celebration. And the uh, Jews have done it ever since. It's like we celebrated a couple of weeks ago. And that became Jesus' Last Supper. And the church took that and converted it into the Eucharist, which came to us today as the um, communion service that we do today. So what I want, as you take these elements in your hands, realize that you're holding a condensed, a really, really, uh, like I said, compact picture of the original Passover. So we're going to go back to the Passover and try to connect some dots between them and us. Uh, if you remember the story, God had kept his promise to Abraham, made him into a great nation, put him into Egypt under Egypt's protection while they prospered and procreated and became a great nation and became political. And then Pharaoh had his own mode of gerrymandering and put him into slavery. And then I guess uh, God decided to let them know it was time to leave to the promised land for uh, the completion of his promise to Abraham to give him the land. The thing is, Pharaoh wouldn't let him go, and then you remember, they, uh, Pharaoh passed judgment, he's gonna let the angel of death kill all the firstborn. He didn't exclude the Hebrews at that time. All the firstborn in my family would have been me and Betty and my son and my first grandson and my new great-granddaughter. But there was an out, and here's the out. I'm going to take selected verses from Exodus 12. The uh, Lord said to Moses, on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb without blemish, shall kill the lambs, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorpost and the lentils on the houses where they eat it. Take some of the blood, put it on the doorpost, and then the angel of death will pass over your house. And that will release them this is a phrase that carries through, connecting the dots, release them from bondage to begin a new life. And I can imagine somebody's gonna say, that sounds like a mandate, I don't do mandates. And God says, when I see the blood, oh, but it's my body, it's my choice. God says, when I see the blood, May I be excused? I don't want to miss the Super Bowl game. God says, when I see the blood. So, Christ is our Passover lamb. Connect the dots. When Satan comes to you, 
to refresh your memory of your past failures, God says, when I see the blood, Heavenly Father, only you, only you can make a plan to retain your holiness and still, and still reconcile us to you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Throughout human history, uh, there seems to be built into our DNA uh, to be able to sacrifice to God. Uh, I guess different cultures have different attitudes about what that means. And the Israelite system sacrificed the first, firstborn and the best, belong to God. And for us, it's to show our thanks because he paid the debt that he didn't owe, a debt that we owed but couldn't pay. And his debt, his payment, was the ultimate sacrifice that filled all the sacrifices. So what's left for us to show our appreciation? Uh, there's a story about David sacrificing to stop a plague. And he goes to the threshing field of Odin and Odin says, hey, you're the king. I'll give you the sacrifice. I'll give you the wood. I'll give you the animals to sacrifice. And David says, no, I'm not going to give God that which costs me nothing. So I think Jesus brought it home to us when he showed the disciples the widow's mite that just gave two pennies after others had given many, many dollars more. Jesus told us it's not the dollar amount, it's the heart. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to share our heart with you and with your kingdom. We thank you that we've been able to see we have the record with all to do this. And we do thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so into the sermon. If you have your Bibles, please open with me to Exodus chapter 27. I'm not going to get as all involved as I did last time, but I want to bring you back to where we're at. Because last time we met, we talked about this tabernacle, a building that was 45 feet long and 18 feet wide, and 15 feet tall. So again, just as a reminder, that's from the outer seat right there in front of Lyman to that outer seat on the other side here. That's the length, 45 feet. 18 would be from the very front top step right here to the back wall. It was that wide and that long and about as tall as the bottom of the hanging lights, this first row, about 15 feet up. So that gives you some feel for the building itself. We talked about the fact that there was a box put in here called the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Testimony, and that that made that the Holy of Holies, the holy place where God would meet with His people. He's actually going to call this place the Tent of Meeting in this passage today, where He will meet with His people. And we're reminded that there was inside a candelabra and a table of showbread. And that's what we got last week. So that's where we left off with our teaching last time. As we open this morning, there are three things that we're going to look at. The altar, the court, and the oil. Random things, but again, God is building what he's trying to teach. Right now we're going to get into this and I'll, I'm just going to go ahead and ruin the story for you. How many of you remember the ooh, ah, 
big bad melodrama of the golden calf. That's chapter 32. And chapter 32 divides God telling the people how to do it. Then you have the golden calf episode in 32, and then they do it. So we're going to get a chance after we get through chapter 32 to come back and see how all of this fits together. And I'll unpack more of the stuff then. Read with me, if you will, in Exodus chapter 27. Build an altar of acacia wood, three cubits high, to be square, five cubits long and five cubits wide. Make a horn at each of the four corners so that the horns and the altar are of one piece and overlay the altar with bronze. Make all its utensils of bronze, its pots to remove the ashes and its shovels, sprinkling bowls, meat forks and fire pans. Make a grating for it, a bronze network, and make a bronze ring at each of the four corners of the network. Put it under the ledge of the altar so that it is halfway up the altar. Make poles of acacia wood for the altar and overlay them with bronze. The poles are to be inserted into the rings so they will be on two sides of the altar when it is carried. Make the altar hollow out of boards. It is to be made just as you were shown on the mountain. I watched a video this week by a guy who claims to be an atheist. All he was was a complainer. He goes going through this chapter and he says, you know, I get tired of, you know, can, couldn't Moses tell us what was going on? Where's the detail, God? You know, make it like you saw it on the mountain. That doesn't help the rest of us. We're not the ones responsible to build it. And God was showing Moses how to build these things. And we have the record of the rabbis following to know what a lot of these things actually came to look like. But this altar, these altar of burnt offerings, an altar that would become the heart of the sacrificial system that God will continue to implement. You see, we've already had Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, others in the past who have offered sacrifices to the Lord, but we've not had a systematic, formal way of doing that because it was an individual thing. They weren't a nation. Now God has claimed the children of Israel as a nation. He has grown them from the 70 people that went into Egypt to over 2 million people coming out of Egypt. He has fulfilled His promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and turned them into a people. He has offered them the Ten Commandments of His covenant and has said, Will you serve me? And they have said, Yes, everything you have said we will do. They have now covenanted together. They have now eaten a covenant meal. And God says, great. I want to live with you. I want to move right in here where you can come see me. But I'm holy and you're not. And so there are things that need to happen for you to approach me. And that's going to involve this altar, this place of sacrifice. Acacia wood. How many of you know that wood burns in a fire? Anybody confused by that? Okay, so building an altar out of wood must have seemed a little funny when they first got the word, but then that sentence finishes with covered with bronze. So this wood would give the structure and the bronze would protect it from the heat, would protect it from being actually able to burn. So the closing of that bronze was key to keep the wood inside it safe. Now, this was not a cube, but a short square because we're told that it was three cubits high. That's four and a half feet. Okay? How many of you guys were expecting this great big altar? Uh-uh, four and a half feet. Just three cubits. And it was five cubits square. That's about seven and a half feet. Okay? Not a very big square. Nobody in here is seven and a half feet, so I can't demonstrate that. 
But you stop and think about it. Most of us, you know, I'm about 5'10", so that's probably about 8 foot. So take me off at the wrist. About that big. If I were to lay down inside this altar, that's the point. I could. I could lay down inside this altar and it'd just be a little bit longer than me top to bottom. I could turn and go the other way and it would be about the same because it's seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet and about four and a half feet off the ground. Now, it talks about these horns of the altar. Well, the horns of the altar are an interesting thing. It's part of the culture, but I want you to see this That wasn't very good. Okay, so you've got this altar that at the top of the corners, the wood continues up and comes to a point. So it looks like it has horns. And there's a horn on each altar, on each corner of the altar, because that's what he said to do. There should be horns at the four corners out of the same wood. So in other words, the horn wasn't this its own thing and then attached, but it was supposed to be one piece with the leg. So the leg would come up and it would come out in this horn-looking shape out towards the four directions. This thing was supposed to have completely bronze utensils. Wouldn't melt in the fire. You can scrape the ash. You can get the meat on and off. Okay, so th look at the utensils that are listed. Ash pots, shovels, sprinkling bowls, meat forks, pans. And then it kind of gets a little weird. It's really hard if you're reading the King James. Because this whole thing with a grating and a network and a... Okay, all of you all, this is easy. Grill. A, a network. A network. Okay, a, a grating. So you got to have something that you can put the meat on in the altar. So you've got these four sides with this network or this grill that's hung by chains to a ring that's hanging on the four corners of this altar so that that network hangs halfway down the altar. So wait a minute, that's pretty high off the ground. It's because you've got to have a fire under it to have a burnt offering. So you've got the fire down below and the grating and then sides so the meat doesn't fall off the grating. Okay? This hung halfway up, or about a cubit and a half, about two and a quarter feet. Okay, would have been up. And it's carried on poles when they're moving. Obviously they let it cool down first. So basically, I want you to see this, it is four sides and a grill, which is why the Bible says it's supposed to be hollow in the middle, just made with boards. Because everything we've done to this point looked like a box or a table. So he's telling them, look, the middle's hollow. There's nothing in it. Don't try to finish the thing. I get fire underneath, grate in the middle, meat on top, sides on it to keep everything in place. Pretty simple little grill. Without being sacrilegious, because I'm, I'm really not trying to be, but think of this thing as God's hibachi. Okay, he's going to have meat sacrifices put out there. Certain pieces of meat that will be put on the grates. The grating is going to be close enough that the meat won't fall through. They're going to put doves on there. They're going to put, so he's going to use rabbit wire. He's not going to use goat wire. Okay, so this is a close network grading system that will hold to cook and to burn the meat. Because not every sacrifice that's put on this offering, on this altar, will be burnt. Or as the Cajuns like to say, blackened. A lot of the meat on this thing will be eaten. It becomes the priest's share. 
you would bring a sacrifice and it would be cooked there over the altar and it would be pulled off, which is why you needed meat hooks, meat forks, to be able to go back in the fire and get the meat off. So some altars, some of the stuff that got put on the altar was left there until it burned completely. Other stuff was cooked in part. And we'll understand that better as we better understand the system of sacrifices as we study later books. Nobody's sure exactly what this thing looked like. Um, it irritates me. Most of the images show the altar edges going all the way to the ground. And I'm like, have you ever built a fire? If you build this thing out of to the ground, how do you get the ashes out? How do you put more wood in? So you've got to think these things through about how this thing would have worked because I want you to stop and think about, oh, I don't know, say Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, where everybody's bringing animals or Passover, where there's all kinds of animals being brought. I mean, there's going to be days where you're not just putting one or two animals on this thing. You've got the entire nation bringing a lamb each for each household. So you've got to have this thing in continuous use. If the sides go all the way to the ground, you can't get the ash out. You can't put more wood in. So this thing had to be a working fire pit. So then we get to the courtyard. Verses 9 through 19. Make a courtyard for the tabernacle. The south side shall be a hundred cubits long and is to have curtains of finely twisted linen with 20 posts and 20 bronze bases and with silver hooks and bands on the posts. The north side shall also be a hundred cubits long and is to have curtains with 20 posts and 20 bronze bases and with silver hooks and bands on the posts. The west end of the courtyard shall be 50 cubits wide and have curtains with 10 posts and 10 bases. On the east end, toward the sunrise, the courtyard shall also be 50 cubits wide. Curtains 15 cubits long are to be on one side of the entrance with three posts and three bases. And curtains 15 cubits long are to be on the other side with three posts and three bases. For the entrance to the courtyard, provide a curtain 20 cubits long of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and finely twisted linen, the work of an embroiderer, with four posts and four bases. All the posts around the courtyard are to have silver bands and hooks and bronze bases. The courtyard shall be a hundred cubits long and fifty cubits wide, with curtains of finely twisted linen five cubits high, and with bronze bases. All the other articles used in the service of the tabernacle, whatever their function, including all the tent pegs for it and for those of the courtyard, are to be of bronze." Okay, so let me see if I can help you make sense out of this. There is to be a courtyard around the tabernacle. How many of you guys have a picket fence around your house? Okay, that's what you're looking at. And this, as I reminded you before, we've got this thing is 45 feet by 18 feet. And so what we're being told here is that this, and this, by the way, is backwards. I built the whole thing backwards. I'm so dumb. Because I've set this thing up that this is east, and we all know east is on that end. And you let me do it. I'll talk to you later. All right. Anyway, so the north side and the south side and the east side. So I got this thing backwards because this that would be north. This would be south. Well, yeah, if I built it properly. Okay, we, we can do that. Yeah, there you go. There you go. See y'all smarter than I am. Both and this would be north. So Okay. I'll hand here in a second. This is 150 feet by 75 feet long. And then up front, there's another curtain that covers that opening. So to get in, you would simply come through between the narrow spot and go around the other one. 
So you could funnel in, you could funnel out, you could move in and out of this courtyard. Made of finely twisted linen, north and south sides 100 cubits or 150 feet long, with 20 posts on each side. You see the fence? You've got a curtain with 20 posts that's 150 feet long on the north side. And then on the south side, the same thing. So basically you've got a post every seven and a half feet. And everything has bronze bases and silver hooks and silver bands to hold the curtain. And then the west end is 50 cubits and it's 75 feet long with 10 posts, about one every seven and a half feet, with bronze bases and silver hooks and hands and bands to hold the curtain. The east end is also 50 cubits. It's a rectangle. And so, but they only come 15 cubits off of the north and south wall. So basically... <clears throat> that's 45 feet, so that 15 cubits is 22 and a half feet there and 22 and a half feet there. And then that leaves you with a center curtain of 20 cubits, which is 30 feet in the middle. Lots of people can get in and out of this thing. The east end is 50 cubits, just like the west end. Three posts holding the curtains, and then four posts holding that curtain. Again, bronze bases, silver hooks, and bands to hold the curtains up. The only difference is, this is just a white linen all the way around. But the entrance is defined by the same words as the first layer in the tent. You remember last week we talked about there's four layers in the tent and the inside layer was fine linen with blue and purple and scarlet thread. Well, what's this lead curtain look like? It's fine linen with blue and purple and scarlet embroidery. So the front curtain looks just like the front curtain looks just like the inside. We're not told that they did cherubim on them. The cherubim were on the inside of the tabernacle. This just says the work of an embroiderer. So we don't know if it was a pattern, if it, how they made that. They made it according to whatever Moses saw on the hill. And then he comes back and concludes out at the end of this passage, that it's 100 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and this is where he drops the bomb. Five cubits high. That's seven and a half feet, friends. The same width as the altar. Again, cut me off at the wrist. So how is it that you get to the tabernacle? right here because the rest of it is a single curtain it's a fence and it's facing towards the east facing towards the sunrise and we're told that everything else is to be made of bronze just one of those kind of throwaway lines but if you ever wondered what they make the tent pegs out of bronze what would they make that extra shovel or the hammer that they drove the thing down in or the, if it was made for the tabernacle it was made of bronze okay. interesting to me there's a focused entry it's focused that when I am outside trying to get to God there's only one way And that everything walks along a certain purpose to get there. There's steps and there's stages. Mankind has been crying out since the garden, how do we get to God? Here's your answer. Here's your map. You come through this courtyard the way that it was made. And everything focuses this direction. You come in from the outside through the alchemy, past this altar. Later we're going to find out there's another thing called a laver or a great big wash basin that gets set right here. And then the holy place and then the holy of holies. So there's things that we have to walk through to get here. And I'll unpack that in the telling once we get through chapter 32. But for now, 
I want to finish our passage today in 20 through 21. Command the Israelites to bring you clear oil of pressed olives for the light, so that the lamps may be kept burning. In the tent of meeting, outside the curtain that is in front of the testimony, Aaron and his sons are to keep the lamps burning before the Lord from evening till morning. This is to be a lasting ordinance among the Israelites for the generations to come. So he says, okay, y- y- oh, we put this lampstand in here and I never told you what to burn in it. Pure olive oil. Okay. The lampstand has already been introduced in chapter 26. We, we've already gone through that, but this is just the oil. Again, the lamp is again told us that it's in, and this is the interesting thing, he calls it the tent of meeting. Not just the tabernacle. What's the purpose of this thing? He wants to meet with us. He wants us to come to Him. He wants us to meet Him here. This is called now the tent of meeting, where He wants us. But He says, in the tent of meeting, that puts it in here, outside of the curtain, where you put the lampstand, that lamp right there is supposed to get pure olive oil. It's in the holy place, not the most holy place. And the priests that is Aaron and his sons, are to keep the lamps burning from evening till morning. Didn't burn 24 hours a day. Just when it was dark. So it was their job to go and to light the lamps just before sundown so that the light would still be on in God's house when the lights got dark. So they were to from evening until morning. By the way, guys, anybody that remembers any of the teachings that I've done on Hanukkah, that's why this is such a big deal. They hadn't been able to light the lamp, and when they lit the lamp, they only had one day's worth of oil, and it lasted seven days because God blessed it with a miracle. And that's where the whole story of Hanukkah comes from, is this lamp and its special oil that was supposed to be processed a certain way. So what can we take out of this explanation? Well, this is one explanation out of many in the Scripture. And like I said, we'll, we'll put it together a little more as we get through the building of it and the description of it. But I want you to think about these three things because I think it tells us three things about God. The first is this altar. You see, the children of Israel don't know it yet, but this is going to become the key, central issue in the entirety of how do you have a relationship with God. Sacrifice for sin. I can't go to God because I'm unholy and He is holy. But God in His economy says that a sacrifice will make me holy enough to come and meet with Him. I can't get to Him without the sacrifice. I can't get to Him without His holiness being given to me through some form of atonement. Are you starting to see the cross? I can't get to God except by the sacrifice of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so the reality is, we look at this thing, and I made the comment about it being God's hibachi. But I want you to see what a simple instrument it is. Four sides and a great And you look at that and you go, it's not even ornate. It's made out of bronze. It's covered with blood. It's used in fires. It's grody. It's nasty. I promise you, the Levites were happy that this thing got carried with sticks. They didn't have to touch it. Kind of sounds like a cross. A simple instrument used to show God's sacrifice for us. And we talk about the oil for the lampstand and how it was pure. And how our God is not a God of waste. He didn't ask for the lights to be burning all the time. 
just evening till morning. You know, it's interesting to me. There's no lamps on the outside because the sun's out there. And there's no sun, there's no light in the holy, 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 holy. What's up with that? I am the light of the world. We are told in Revelation that we will see in heaven, not by the light of a sun, but by the light that emanates from the throne. When God's in his house, he doesn't need electricity. He doesn't need a lamp. He is the light. And then there's this courtyard. And I want to kind of send, spend a little time there this morning. This courtyard is a designation of holy ground. This is God's yard. He says, you guys can park all the way around me, but this is my space. This is my holy ground. This is the place that I will meet with you. This is the place where we will come together and we will fellowship together. Those, cap those curtains do two things. They encapsulate and they exclude. You can't do one without the other. That is to say, everything that's inside is inside. You can't get out of that courtyard except through this court, through this gateway. That means you also can't get except through this gateway. Which should help you to see that I can't get to God this way. I can't get to God this way. I can't get to God this way. I can only get to God this way. So you're either on the inside or you're on the outside. There's only one way in. And the religious pundits of our day, the philosophers of this humanity, want to tell us with bumper stickers that we should all just coexist. And yeah, we should. I don't need to kill you because you're of a different religion and you don't need to oppress me because I am. But the reality is, there's only one truth. There's only one God. There's only one way. And that's why Jesus calls himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the light. Everything in this begins to point towards how do I come to God only through Jesus Christ. There is not the... I, sorry, I'm going to offend some folks this morning. Probably nobody in here, but folks that might be listening... All roads do not lead to God. There is only one God and there is only one way to serve Him. And I don't get to change what this book says to what I want it to because I would love to. There are things in this book I don't like because it crimps my style. Because I'm a fallen human being and I want it my way. Which means, quite honestly, I want to be God. Anybody else in the room? You might say, well, I wouldn't want to be God. Yes, you do. You're just lying to yourself. Because that's what sin is. When we tell God, you're not God, I am. I'm going to do it my way. And God says, there's only one way, my way. But I don't want to do it your way, God. Create your own universe. This one's mine. Jesus said, I am the way. When he said, I am the way, he brought everybody's attention. Right there. Because he finishes that by saying, no one gets to the Father except through me. I'm the way. There is no other way to get to God. And so this fence, this courtyard, isn't just a picket fence to make God's yard look pretty. It's seven and a half feet high.
It's a line of demarcation. It is a wall and not a fence. I was sitting Easter Sunday listening to Kent out at the Passion Play at the sunrise service. And it just struck me. How many people in our world are trying to straddle the fence? One foot in the world and one foot in righteousness. I want to do it my way, but I also want to do it God's way. I want to be godly and I, do, I want to avoid hell and I'd like to please God, but I want to do it on my terms. And I heard the voice of God resounding in my ears. There is no fence. It's a chasm. And your legs aren't long enough. Choose which side you will be on because you won't be able to straddle this thing and make your decision in the last 20 seconds. There's only one way in. And it's not over here. And it's not over here. And it's not out here. I don't want us to go around the world asking, are you a Christian? Because that can mean too many things to too many other people. I want to know, who is Jesus Christ in your world? Because if He's a good man or a philosopher or a priest or an idiot, you're lost. If He is the way to God, the Lamb that takes away the sins of the world, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and my personal Savior, then you're on the inside. Too many in a people in our world are trying to live a life that straddles the fence, and there is no fence. There is no partial salvation, friends. We're either all in, following His precepts and His commands and depending on His mercy. Or we are all out, following the philosophies and religions of this world and depending on either our self-righteousness or some false god or just praying that none of this is actually true. I would love to say that you could come to God your way, but that's not what the Bible teaches. There is only one way to God, and it's Jesus Christ. But I want you to see, it's not hard to get in. It doesn't even close, y'all. It's open all the time. And when you find yourself at the entrance, it's really easy to walk in. And you say, well, I, I don't have a sacrifice. I don't have anything to bring to God. You bring you, because there's already a lamb on the altar that's paid your price. All you've got to do is walk in. All you've got to do is come. It is a tent of meeting Come to the Lord. Heavenly Father, as we close this talk this morning, I pray that every heart and life might in this moment choose whom they will serve. Lord, as, as we have that thought, as we have that conversation, it's not a choosing at one point and then going back to old habits. It's a choosing to serve God moment by moment. Lord, I'll be the first to admit that there's times I choose me over you and I hurt those around me. I snap. I say something inappropriate. I allow a thought or an image that comes into my mind to stay just a little too long. My fallenness and my brokenness and my sin sometimes distract me and every time they do it hurts relationship with you with others with me 
Lord, every single moment of every single day, I have to choose you. I'm not worried about my salvation for you paid that price once and for all and I've accepted you and I know that a lot of folks in this room have done that already and so our foibles and our mistakes on a daily basis is just you growing us up into your righteousness. But there's a whole lot of people out there, Lord, that haven't made that choice. Oh, they're sitting where they think they're inside the camp, but the reality is they're outside that curtain. They have never faced Jesus Christ. They have never received His sacrifice on the altar. They think that just because they're leaned up against one of those posts with the bronze base and the silver hooks and bands, that they're in. But Lord God, they're on the wrong side of the fence. I pray, Lord God, that you would challenge each one of our hearts to look around ourselves spiritually, to assess who we are in you, to know with confidence and with comfort, and to live in the peace and the knowledge that we are in with you. I pray, Lord God, that you would this day break the lie of Satan in the eyes and hearts and minds of your children who think that they can follow you in their way or in some other way. Lord God, your word is clear. May the scales fall from their eyes. May their hearts be softened that they might receive you this day. Lord, these passages are dry. And they're just about tents and pegs and posts. But thank you, Lord God, because in those, you show us a picture of who you are and what you call us to. Lord, I pray that as we continue to unpack these few chapters that we have left here in Exodus, that you would burn within our hearts, not simply a rejoicing that we don't have to follow this system anymore, that we are under grace and not the law, but that, Lord, we would understand what the price of that grace was because of the law. Thank you, Lord God. Exactly as Lyman prayed earlier, we thank you that in your holiness you came to a way of redemption through giving of yourself so that your blood would cover our need, your sacrifice would cover our being empty-handed so that we might come to know you. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Thank you, Father, for this image of the tabernacle that just reinforces in this picture our understanding of you. Guide our hearts this morning to yield and if there's anyone in this place, Lord, that is unsure, may they leave this place confident in their faith in you. And we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. This morning you are welcome to come for prayer. Welcome to come and love the Father. Just come. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. There is only one God. There is only one King. There is only one body. That is why we can sing. So bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that 
it cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together. Bind us together with love. There is only one God. So there is only one God. There is only one King. There is only one body. That is why we can sing. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with your love. As we go from this place, may God bless you with seeing Him in His fullness. May you know the breadth and the depth and the height of His love for you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.